Hi guys, my name is Shannon Harris. I'm with the Kaizen Media team and here I have with me multi-business owning, serial entrepreneur, real estate king, Asian American wow. activist, and world-renowned hand model, Nan Lin. <laughs> Did you practice that? Well, I wrote it. <laughs> oh, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for taking time out of your busy day to answer yeah, some yeah, questions yeah, with me. Deal. And give you guys an idea, for authenticity purposes, I was not allowed to look at any of the questions. Right, yeah, cool. he has no idea what we're asking. I think you guys um, are here for a treat. We're going to learn more about him as a person and what yeah. he does with business. So let's dive right in. How did you get started in real estate? How did you get started in investing? And how did you put the two together? I was on summer break from school and I found out one of my friends was in real estate. Something about it was really attractive to me and I wanted to get involved. Uh, long story short, I asked him, I'm like, hey, what do you do? How did you get all this like money? And he told me he was starting a real estate company. And I said, all right, well, you know, let me come in and uh, work for you. And I came in the next day. I started uh, cold calling for him. Long story short, I was doing the bottom barrel stuff, helping me, you know, set up the office and just doing like, I guess, beginner work, just the very minimum. How old were you? I was 17. Okay, so real estate, long time. So mm -hmm. how did you get into investing? When I first started, everything was doing great. Everybody was refinancing, everybody was getting loans. This was during the time right before the real estate bubble burst. So everybody involved in the industry was making a killing, including myself at 17 years old, 17, 18 at that time. And I was doing very good until the market crashed. So imagine like we're getting leads every single day, we're making a killing. This is me before the age of 18. And suddenly the market crashed. And so we go from large sum of income to literally like zero. At that time, I'm like, holy shit, like I can't pay for my cars. I can't pay for my apartment. Like, what am I going to do? Long story short, I went back to school and I had to borrow money from my mother to pay for rent and pay for cars, all this stuff. And she actually, she was gracious enough to give me money. And after a few years of going to school, I hated it. I was in school for a few years. I dropped out. I started working for these other businesses because you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. And at one point I was working three different occupations and I finally saved up a bulk sum of money. And I bought my first property to hide, to stash away, to protect the money I earned. And that was, you know, quote unquote, my first investment. It was a house for $86,900. I remember it was a three bedroom, one bath with an illegal addition to expand the house's living room. While I worked in real estate, I learned about financing part of real estate, how to get loans, how to qualify people for loans, underwrite people, how loans work. So I have very solid foundation in that aspect. And when I made enough money, I'm like, I need to protect this money because, you know, I don't want to be like everybody else who makes money and just spend it. So I saved enough to buy my first property in cash. And that was 86,000, you know, 786,900 dollars, whatever it was. How old were you? I want to say like 21, uh, 2021. This was like a few years after the initial bubble burst and went from no income to holding three quote unquote jobs three sources of income where I made enough money to buy the first property. So for someone who has no education in real estate, how should they get started? So being an agent, you're essentially a person that helps facilitate transactions between buyer and seller. You understand everything and anything that has to do with the product and your buyer and seller. That's different from being an investor because, you know, as an investor, you need to be well informed of what is happening in real estate industry, but you don't necessarily need to be a broker or a real estate agent to be a very good investor. On the contrary, you know, I had this internal dialogue. I wanted to know if I should get my license again to be a realtor and eventually be a broker and to help facilitate with my investments. And I landed on not going that route because I was already somewhat educated in, you know, the real estate industry. And I felt that being a realtor or being a broker, very good money would distract me from great money. Does that make sense? Like I will make hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions, but I feel like that sum of money would distract me from my larger goal, which is making hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And so I went with not getting my real estate license back and not pursuing being a realtor or a broker so that I can focus on my larger goal of uh, being a real estate mogul over time. And you know, that's my route. And I feel like everybody is different. If you're asking from a perspective of a person that have zero experience in real estate, I will highly advise that yes, you should get your real estate license so that you can understand 
what this is. Does that make sense? If you want to be an investor in the future and you don't know about real estate, like what are you investing in? Like you don't even know your product, right? You need to understand your product before you can invest. If you guys are watching this, if you're in your 20s, hey, do whatever you need to to satisfy your craving to figure out what the world is. Does that make sense? Start out as many businesses as you want, up as many times as you want. That's what I did. And in your 20s is a time to learn. It's not a time to be a shellfish where you're a reclusive little turtle. Does that make sense? In your 20s is a time to be bold. It's time to have your balls out and go tackle the streets, right? That's the time to do that. In your 30s though, it is time to really refine the processes in which you do things so that you can focus on what you know to be true and best and what works. Because in your 30s, you feel like you don't have any more time to waste. You know, I'm 35, I'm turning 36. In this time and age, in this decade, I'm focused wholeheartedly on my craft, on things that I know work for 100%. I don't have time to waste anymore because in order to achieve my goals, like 30 is the time to build. I think 20 is the time for discovery. Did you come from a family that was in real estate or a family that was well off at all with money? I'm an immigrant. My dad was a teacher and he was in the computers at an early age. And my mom, she's a kick-ass entrepreneur. And over time, my dad became a kick-ass entrepreneur too. But we came from very humble beginnings. You know, I came from a third world country where it was tough. Okay, I'm talking about like not my family personally. I feel like they've done well for themselves relative to the people around them. Does that make sense? I think, you know, compared to people in America, they didn't make much money at all. However, compared to where they were, they were well to do, they were educated. And my mom, you know, actually tested like number one or number two in the entire country in one of the most esteemed colleges, universities. And that's why she was able to launch her own company in China, but that company is within a division in the Republic of China. Does that make sense? So she doesn't own it. The state owns it, but she's the one that created the company. And the company was for international trade, but it was to benefit understanding of the world. So it had to deal with like, like international trades, but she had to educate like the country on how to interact with other countries essentially. Okay. And that's how she was able to travel outside of the country. And when she came to America, she's like, man, this is the land of the free. I need to get my son here somehow. Long story short, in order for us to move here, she had to give up the company that she built to move here. I don't know like, if you can understand. After a certain amount of time, the state kind of took care of a lot of things in China. And over time, we were well to do. Well, I was closer to 19 years old. But when we transitioned here in the States, when we first moved here, I remember we actually lived in a house, but it was someone's in-law. Like we didn't live in a house, but we had to go on the side of the garage, go up the stairs. And I remember right when you walk in, the space is probably less than like where we're sitting now. And it was the living room, the kitchen and everything else. And you go upstairs, it was a very small room and it was the bedroom. And from there, you know, she slowly like built herself back up. Like she opened a small deli. She's just a gangster ass person. But if you're talking about like well-to-do, it depends on who you're comparing it to. Compared to people that she was around, that my parents were around, they were very well-to-do. Compared to people here in America, I would say we're below the income average. You know, I lived in an apartment all the way up to the age of like 16 or something like that. And finally, my mom bought a house in Sacramento uh, for like $200,000 back in the days. And it was like the best thing we ever had. So um, she couldn't just pick up her company and move. She had to leave everything correct, in China. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she had to leave everything in China. She had to leave it to like her second in command and just have them take care of it. Because long story short, she basically just bounced. I see. Yeah. She was like, I'm taking my son to, you know, America so he can have a better life. I remember we had our own state assigned drivers in China moved here. We're in a champagne colored hatchback Subaru with paint missing. But I think that transition where like, I didn't know how well she was doing in China in her position. And when we moved to America, like that gap, the, the transition was insane. And I remember just being very humble, living in a, you know, in-law and being dropped off in this champagne colored hatchback Subaru. And I think that's why I'm overcompensating. Uh, if you guys know me, like I buy a lot of nice cars. I feel that that is trauma from childhood and I'm overcompensating <laughs> for my trauma. And that's why I need like nice cars to look at even to this day. To go off of that, do you think that you became an entrepreneur or you have the heart of an entrepreneur because of your parents and how you were raised? 100%. I truly feel that the nurture parts of someone's development is very important. And in my lifetime, when I was growing up, I saw how hard both my mom and my dad worked. 
And what I remember just them working all the time. Like remember the life that I had, just like slowly transitioning, like getting better and better and better. But like the life getting better, I saw the hard work that went with it. And seeing that transition and seeing what it took for my parents to establish the level of success that they had, I felt that that had deep impact on my life. Now, I talk to a lot of immigrants here in America and the people I feel like that went through that type of transitions or where like they were immigrants and they saw their parents working very hard and they come to America and suddenly, you know, like they have all this freedom, all this newfound opportunities and they apply that same type of work ethic and their life just is on this upward trajectory. I feel that a lot of the immigrants, they share the same values and they share that same upbringing and that's why they work so hard and they take advantage of opportunities when presented to them because they know how rare it is to have this type of opportunity. You're probably the most work-driven person I've ever met in my life. How did you become such a workaholic? And do you think it's worth quitting the nine to five to be essentially 24 seven? The truth is I am a very, very lazy person. But here's the thing. Most people, like anything they do, they're half-assed at it. Even for lazy people, they're half-assed at being lazy. They're lazy during the day and then they try to cut corners at work, but then you know what happens? They're gonna have to work for the rest of your life. I am a very dedicated person. I know myself all too well. I know I am very lazy. However, I am a dedicated lazy person and a professional lazy person. And the difference is I'm willing to work as much as I can now so that I can be lazy for the rest of my life. Does that make sense? And I'm willing to find the shortest and the most efficient way of achieving that. And I feel like that is just work very hard, you know, since I was 17, uh, work very hard for, you know, 10, 20 years and be able to enjoy it for the rest of my life. You know, live life kind of on your terms, uh, the way that you want, however you want, at, at the time that you want. And I feel like the easiest way to achieve that is by working for yourself. And to answer your question, do I feel that it's worthwhile to work 24 seven and quit the nine to five, right? Is that your question? Mm -hmm. It's worth it for me because again, I'm dedicated to being lazy and I feel like I want to give up anything in the short term for long-term comfort and for long-term freedom. Plus you're working for yourself instead mm -hmm. of for someone else. That's probably a benefit to working 24 seven. Well, initially I worked for somebody else too. And uh, when I made enough money, I started making that transition out. I remember while I was like actively working for somebody else, I had a nine to five. After a nine to five, I'll drive an hour and a half to Berkeley, spend two, three hours there and then drive another 30 minutes or 45 minutes home. And then once I got home, I have to sit there and game plan. And then that's already like one and two AM and you get up again and you do the nine to five all over again. And then on the weekends, we're like working all weekends too. I didn't drink from the age of 19 to 25. I don't think I took a vacation besides like visiting family in China like once or twice. I didn't take any other vacations because the idea was spend as much time working now as you can. And then you compact your learning curve. You compact the amount of time that you're working so that you can have a better retirement and make more money. So you were born in China. I wouldn't compare your life to anything American lifestyle as growing up. Elementary school, junior high, high school, college, career. You had a different upbringing. Can you tell us what your upbringing is? I went to elementary school, fifth to sixth grade here. Moved to Sacramento, went to school for like barely a year. I think I got like suspended or kicked out or something like that. <laughs> I, I forgot what it was. And then I had to go to military school, yeah. Okay, till what age? 18. Okay, so sixth grade to 18. Mm. Wow. Yeah, very different than traditional Americans. You told me that you fly like 200, 300 days a year. Is that something you've come to despise traveling or is it just like a blur? It's just like part of your day to day. I think flying is better than driving. If you drive from San Francisco, to Sacramento, that's two hours of your life gone. And you have to sit there and pay attention. Versus me going to the airport, just go to the airport and I'm working at the airport, get on the plane, I'm working on the plane or I'm doing whatever on the plane. I think it's very natural part of life and then just naturally like progress that way. So instead of driving, I to fly. From San Francisco to Sacramento, it's like almost two hours. Mm -hmm. And then from a flight to, from LA to Sacramento, which you do all the time, that's an two hour. hours or an, an hour, hour and a half. half. And you can do work on the plane. That makes Correct. sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not bad at all. I love traveling. So is travel something that comes with the territory or something that you feel works for you? Territory as in what you do in your career? Well, what traveling is, okay, when you fly on a plane, you're essentially just minimizing distance. Like back in the days, if you had to walk from San Francisco to Sacramento, uh, it's gonna take you days, right? Versus driving, it takes two hours. 
it just makes the world smaller. And I choose to be in three different cities in a monthly basis. That's, that's my choice, right? I don't have to live in Los Angeles, but I just feel like that is such a difficult place to live in that I have to go conquer that area. And once I establish like a foothold in the city, I tend to keep it. Like I don't want to relinquish my relationships. I don't want to relinquish what I have established there or else why did I go there in the first place? You From know? my perspective on that, you do your investments and properties in Sacramento, mm -hmm. but you live in LA for connections and putting yourself forward. Is that right? Love Sacramento. Okay, if you live in Sac, love it, okay? <laughs> But I just choose not to live here because I feel that everybody here is too comfortable. When I go to San Francisco, I want to go to LA though. I'm very inspired, especially in Los Angeles. I'm like, I look around, I'm like, I am not a big fish here at all. <laughs> I'm a it guppy. Motivates you. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like a little guppy here. This is, it's great. And I see all the money. I'm like, that's what I can have. That's the type of life I can have. That's the person I want to become. Uh, here, not, you know, in Sacramento, not necessarily. I feel like people need that motivation and it's a constant driver in life. And anytime I think I do well, I go to places like Las Vegas to figure out how much money I don't have. I live in LA and I'm like, okay, well, I need to do better so I can buy this like $10 million penthouse. It keeps me motivated. And then in Sacramento, it's very stable. This is where I choose to have my company and I feel like there's a lot of opportunity here, but it takes someone that is motivated to extract the opportunity. Make sense? Makes sense. Kaizen, your company just turned 10 years. First of all, congratulations. That's a big milestone. I hope you get 100 more. So how did you come up with the name Kaizen? Kaizen is a Japanese philosophy that stands for constant improvement and constant development. The idea behind it is that if you just better your best in all aspects of your life by a tiny bit on a day-to-day -day basis, over time, these tiny gains will amount to something quite large. And this was a philosophy taught to me by my previous mentor. And essentially it's a physical, intellectual, spiritual, and then finances. You know, there was like a whole bunch of categories and we were to be better in each category all the time. Like we're constantly competing with ourselves, but just by a tiny margin. And I felt that that philosophy itself really changed my life. And when I started this company, Kaizen Capital, I was trying to find a name, but I needed a name with meaning. And I felt that it'd be fair that I named this company Kaizen Capital because the philosophy of Kaizen has benefited my life so much. And I was hoping to apply this philosophy to this company and to the rest of my life and thus Kaizen Capital. I love that. It has meaning. Have you read mm -hmm. the book Atomic Habits? Yes, of course. That reminds me of that. Yeah. Yeah. Same little was well, same little concepts. Middle. Yeah, correct. Little habits make mm -hmm. a big difference. There's a common quote in your Kaizen videos, turning shit to gold. Can you tell us how that started and why it stuck? Shit to gold, all right? If I had a choice, I wouldn't go for these crazy like rundown properties. I feel that that is one phase of our business where we take like just really, really dilapidated properties, renovate them and convert them into something of value, okay? And when we create value like that, we get compensated quite well. I remember, I think it was during a walkthrough of a property, I'm like, damn, this is, this property is so shitty. But then I was giving myself a positive pep talk. I'm like, this property is so shitty, but we're gonna make a good amount of money from this. We're gonna create value out of this and we're gonna make gold, okay, from something so shitty. And so I think I was just like, man, we're gonna turn this shit into some gold. And over time, it just became shit to gold. And and just that, stuck because it's something it, that you do. Yeah. You deal with shit properties. And then... Over time, yeah. We literally turn these just insane properties where sometimes almost dangerous into like a valuable asset where it helps investors make money and with proper tenants and make it look very nice, just creating a lot of value essentially. Is there a difference between what you're describing and mm -hmm. house flipping? Yes. Well, they have some commonalities. Commonalities being like what flippers do is that they take an undervalued asset that's also in very poor condition and they will renovate it and then they will sell the asset, sell the property, flip it, okay? We go through the same process, but a couple of things that we do differently is that we only touch multifamily. We don't deal with single family homes. Most flippers, they deal with single family homes. So we only touch multifamily at the same time at the end of flip cycle. A normal person that flips a property will exit the property. We would do like a cash out refi or we would have a capital event 
where we get to keep the property. Does that make sense? Because to me, there's more value in keeping the asset than really increasing the asset. Not only do we renovate the property, but we do some type of value add, meaning that we'll build additional units atop the property, or we'll convert freestanding structures that's not habitable into a habitable units, thus creating additional value so that we can generate additional rental income. Our end goal is not to sell the property and make that margin. You know, majority of people who do flip properties, their end goal is to make that margin and take that margin out and then get into a couple more properties. Our end goal is that once we complete the renovation and we do some type of value add, our goal is to have rental income, pull out the money, keep the asset and reinvest the margins. And so over time, you know, the difference is that now I have a decent portfolio versus people who are just doing these like transactional buying and selling, buying and selling, you know, they don't have a very large portfolio. And do you consider that like fast money? I consider like flipping properties to me is almost like a job. It is fast money. Uh, versus when you are doing like cash out refis, you leave more money in the asset that you just finished renovating. So you actually take less money out, but then you get to keep the asset. So it's more long-term, but it's gonna take more work. You get a little bit less money, 20, 30% than you would just exiting the property. Dealing with tenants and real estate, there's bound to be problems. What is the most nightmare of a situation that you've had? It is not for the faints of hearts. You need capital reserves and you need a lot of mental fortitude. And I can tell you by dealing with all these tenants, as much as I've tried to not let these people skew my perception of humanity, they have. And I despise people who take advantage of others. I despise people who take advantage of the system. And I feel like I'm becoming like relentless against these people. I almost feel like I'm like going to war with these false, like with their I'm talking about like people who try to take advantage of the system, take advantage of others. I've had people who have ability to work, choose not to work and choose not to pay rent. And I feel like it's almost like correction officers where they deal with people like that all the time and messes with their head. I have definitely noticed like my mental shift on how I view people who try to take advantage of others. What is a misconception that people have towards landlords? Oh, everybody thinks all landlords do great. They have a bunch of money. That's not necessarily the case. You know, institutional landlords. Yeah, sure. Maybe, but there's a lot of like mom and pop operators where they have one, two, three properties. And for those people, if you have one tenant that doesn't pay you rent, it's detrimental to their financial health. And sometimes because of one non-performing tenant, if brand new investors come into play, buys a property, and this tenant in the property doesn't perform, it could bankrupt somebody. And I don't think people understand that. You know, just because a landlord owns a property, they still have a lot of expenses. They have to pay mortgage, they have to pay property taxes, property management, utilities, property upkeep. And if you don't pay rent, who pays for that? The landlord does. Right, you think everything is free, it's not. And people think that, oh yeah, if I don't pay rent, my landlord will take care of it. How is it gonna take care of it? They probably have a nine to five and then they have to pick up your lack of. If people just did the right things, pay your rent on time. Get a job if you can. Don't try to take advantage of others. Don't try to take advantage of the system. This will be a great world, but there's that disparity and there's that like mental gap. But anyways, the misconception is that people feel that all the landlords do extremely well. And from my personal experience, especially mom and pop operators, that is not the case. Well, I feel like another misconception is that people think that landlords are evil, oh, unless yeah. you are a landlord. Oh yeah, people think, yeah, I do think so. Oh, this person is trying to evict me. And then like, why are they trying to evict you? Is it because you didn't pay rent for three months? <laughs> like, why are they trying to evict you? Well, if it isn't right, the consequences like, of your own actions. Right, like, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> I was gonna add too, like, if you don't wanna pay rent to your landlord, then you just buy a house. Then yeah. You, then, you know. And I think you're a big advocate mm -hmm. of like self-reliance and like self-accountability. Yeah. And I think, you know, like most tenants try to blame their, you know, the outside before pointing into, you know, pointing the fingers to their self first. Um, you know, if they don't feel comfortable with that, then, then buy your own house. house. Yeah. yeah. But most likely they can't buy their own house because they're not financially there yet. Yeah. Because if, you know, poor financial habits or they didn't save enough money yet, or maybe because they're new on their financial journey. But whatever it is, this is my view, this is how I live life. If you're always finding fault in other people, you're not taking accountability. You're just leaving it up to the world to take care of you. And then what kind of life are you gonna have? Is there an end game where you're gonna kick back and retire? Or do you think this is something that you're gonna do till you die? Why would you retire from something that you love doing? Like people that wanna retire is like, oh, I can't wait until you retire. You must really hate your job. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like what I'm doing, it's like, I acquire an asset, I put proper procedures in place, and it kind of just goes along for the ride. 
And I acquire another asset, it adds to the pool of properties I have and it increases my income and it increases my future earning potential and it increases a lot of things. My ability to be free, my ability to help others. So if you're asking me, hey Nan, when would you give up your ability to expand your asset and your net worth and your ability to take care of others and your ability to access freedom. So no end game, you're gonna just keep doing I, it. I think for me, I'm going to continue to work on my craft because I enjoy what I do. And I feel like this is something that I could do for the rest of my life without stressing too much over time. Obviously, if you look at what I do, I'm not gonna deal with problematic tenants forever. I'm not gonna deal with CD class properties forever. There's levels to this. You know, in the very beginning, you deal with really horrible properties because you have the largest margins there. And once I establish asset value or net worth of a certain degree, then I'm gonna transition out of that into another asset class or into a completely different investment. But the idea is that I continue to expand on my investments and continue to build the system around it so that over time, the system that I've created can be generational, you know, it can outlive me. While I'm no longer here, while I'm no longer operating, I'll have a board of directors, I'll have a team, I'll have a company to kind of continue expanding on what I've created. A legacy. Yeah. While there is no end game, is there a point where you had the internal realization that you're on the right path and kind of said, hey, I've made it? Initially, when you start anything, it's kind of like a, a trade-off. A lot of efforts, little income, right? This is like anything you do. I'm talking about like being an entrepreneur. Large sum of effort, small returns. And over time though, it should level out and it should be the other way around. Where over time you should put in small amount of effort, large sums of return. And so I felt that I was on the right track when I started to receive what I was letting, giving out. Yeah, that makes sense. Does that make sense? Like the amount of effort I was expanding, I felt like I was getting properly compensated. And then over time, I'm just establishing like systems and I'm doing different type of work. And I, I feel like everything I'm doing is working, but everything I'm doing needs to be improved. And so right now I'm just working on improving all the systems I have in place so that they can all work harmoniously with each other and expand effortlessly. Like, was it a certain car that you bought that you really wanted when you were like, yeah, this is it? Well, okay, if you're talking about cars, majority of all the cars I bought was a reward. Once I established a certain level of income, once I established a certain level of, you know, quote unquote success in my mind, I'm like, this is a reward for the work that you've done, right? So the car was just a reflection of like my personal rewards for myself and as an anchor uh, to my level of success to myself. Like, you know, everybody have bad days and I kind of use like some of these physical like rewards, like, you know, cars, nice things as just physical reminders. Like, hey, you're doing okay. Like, don't be too down on yourself. Like there's better days ahead, even though you're having a shitty day. And then that's another thing, I, you know, I learned while I was young. You shouldn't be splurging just because you have money. You should be setting goals. And then once you hit that goal, then you reward yourself with something nice so that it like anchors in your mind, okay, this is accomplishment for this. And so anytime you have a bad day, you look back on your successes, you're like, dude, like you're doing okay. Just keep on moving forward. If you were to have a conversation with 15 year old Nan, what advice would you give him? And do you think he would be proud of you? You know, at 15 years old, I was still in the age of discovery. I was still trying to find out like who I am, what I am, what I'm doing. And I think at that age, you're easily influenced by your, surroundings and your environment. And I remember at that age, I was not the best person. I was like fighting everybody. <laughs> Again, I don't start fights. I defend myself. And you know, at that age, I do remember at a very young age, I'm like, I need to do something with my life. I just didn't know what to do. If I ever to have a conversation with myself at the age of 15, I believe you're only ready to hear where you can comprehend. If I try to drop a bunch of knowledge on myself at the age of 15, I don't even think I'll be able to absorb that. I think I would just let myself um, go through life and kind of just learn all the lessons I've learned. Because, you know, thinking back, if I had a conversation with myself at the age of 15, focus on what you want, <laughs> figure out what you really want, focus on that. I don't know what I want at 15. Maybe I would have became a doctor. Maybe I would have became like something else. And I wouldn't have gone through all the trials and tribulations that I did to make it to where I am in life today. Uh, but I feel that deep down inside, I always want to be, you know, where I am today. 
but I just didn't know that back then. And if someone would interject and have that conversation with myself, maybe that would have like changed the trajectory I have in life. So maybe I wouldn't have that conversation. Well, so do you think 15 year old Nan would be proud of you on where you are? Oh yeah, oh, 100%. I remember, I'm like, man, I just wanna like be comfortable. I wanna be free. I wanna like do all these things in life. And then now I'm thinking back, I felt that I've established or accomplished a lot of things that I wanted uh, while I was younger. Not everything, but a lot of it. And I feel that, you know, there's still a lot more to do. One thing I would credit my journey up to this point. One big thing is that I remember when I first started building business or I had a mentor, I set a rule for myself. Anything and everything I don't want to do that was beneficial for my life, I had to do. And I remember just internalizing that and I've just gotten used to doing things that make me extremely uncomfortable that I know is benefit to my life. And I credit a lot of my success to that because if, without doing a lot of these uncomfortable things, I truly believe I wouldn't be where I am today. You know, including like public speaking, including, you know, like doing seminars, a lot of business development is like having to expand your business and to expand your business, you have to go into the unknown and if I didn't set that rule for myself, I don't think I'll be where I'm at right now. And you know, for all the entrepreneurs out there, young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs alike, doing things that are of benefit to your business is essential. Especially like the things that you don't want to do, but you know it's going to be extremely beneficial. Those are all the questions I have for you. Wow, Shan. You thank you. Thank you did too. Yeah. But thank you so much. Great for questions. Good answers. Yeah. But thank you for taking your time to answer questions. Anytime. For the people.